We are now continuing with the second part of the gastrointestinal tract infection lecture. Now keep in mind that we're just doing a very brief review of the organisms of the GI tract. You're expected to already know these organisms, what disease they cause, and the key diagnostic tests for each organism based on what we covered last semester. So this is a review. Anything that you don't remember, you should go back to your notes from last semester and re-memorize any flow charts, any key reactions um, that you may have forgotten. Okay, so for part two, we're going to start out by talking about Campylobacter. So if you remember Campylobacter, it is a microaerophilic organism. So Campylobacter needs a specific media for Campylobacter. It's a blood-based agar that has antibiotics in it to inhibit your normal intestinal flora so that Campy will be allowed to grow. If you don't use the specific media for campy, your intestinal flora would overgrow and you'd never find the campylobacter because it takes a couple of days for campylobacter to grow up on a plate. So it will grow in a regular 35 to 37 degree incubator as long as it's in its microaerophilic atmosphere. However, campylobacter Campylobacter jejuni, the pathogenic species of Campylobacter, has optimal growth at 42 degrees. So many laboratories will have a special 42 degree incubator specifically for Campylobacter. So the Campy plates are examined at 24 hours of incubation. You look at them, maybe nothing's coming up yet. You would place them back in the campy pack and put them in for another 24 hours because Campylobacter tends to take a little longer to grow. So many times you need those 48 hours to actually see your Campylobacter colonies. So here is your campy pouch. Two plates fit in one pouch. The pouch has a little um, area in it, a little opening with a little sachet in it. You, you pull off the squeeze bottle. You squeeze the liquid into the opening. It flows down, moistens the sachet, and that sachet is going to generate that microaerophilic environment that Campylobacter needs to grow in. This is a gram stain of Campylobacter. So Campylobacter has a curve to it. It's just like Helicobacter has a curve and Vibrio has a curve. Campylo a curve. Campylobacter tends to be described as seagull winged shaped. So it tends to look like a kind of two curves coming together and look like seagull wings. So Campylobacter jejuni is the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea in the United States. Here's another campy gram stain and you could see you know not all of the organisms have a curve to them. Many of them do but you really can't look at a gram stain just like all of your gram negative rods. You really can't look at it and say oh that's definitely Campylobacter. So you know that there's gram negative rods and yeah a lot of them do have some sort of a curve or seagull wing shape but once again, Vibrio does have a curve, is classically comma-shaped. Helicobacter can also have a curve to it. Here is Campylobacter growing on the CVA Campy agar. And Campylobacter tends to um, kind of flow together. So many times with Campylobacter you don't see nice distinct single colonies. You see this runny looking colony on the plate. 
Okay, we're going to move to our Vibrionaceae family of organisms, which include the genera Aeromonas, Plesiomonas, and Vibrio. So we have our, our pathogenic Vibrio species. We have Vibrio cholera, both the O1 and the non-O1 strains of Vibrio cholera. So Vibrio cholera is an intestinal infection. It leads to rice water stool, so diarrhea that has flecks of mucus and bits of stool material that looks like rice water. And transmission is through contaminated food and water. There's the species Parahemolyticus. This causes severe abdominal cramping and watery diarrhea, and it's commonly due to ingestion of raw shellfish, especially raw oysters. And there's Vibrio vulnificus. Vulnificus causes both gastrointestinal tract and wound infections. It can also lead to severe bacteremia and is due to ingestion of contaminated food or coming into contact with contaminated water. So if you have a, a cut on your skin and you're immunocompromised in any way and you go into water that has Vibrio vulnificus, you can get a wound infection that way. So epidemic cholera, cholera that has been involved in epidemics, worldwide epidemics, the causative agents are Vibrio cholera and Vibrio cholera l -tor. So the entry is ingestion through the mouth. Incubation period is 8 to 48 hours. And Vibrio cholera resides in the small intestine. And the problem with Vibrio cholera is it produces a very potent toxin called cholera toxin. So cholera, the symptoms are severe explosive watery diarrhea that very rapidly leads to dehydration and electrolyte loss and it's described as rice water stools. The other Vibrionaceae members, there's Aeromonas, which can cause diarrhea and gastrointestinal tract infections, as well as wound infections and septicemia. And there's Plesiomonas, which possibly causes intestinal infection, infections, as well as wound and sepsis, but that's rare. Our non-cholera vibrios are Vibrio parahemolyticus, Vibrio vulnificus, and Vibrio alginolyticus. So these are, are considered the halophilic vibrios. So remember halo, salt, philic, loving. So these are organisms that can tolerate higher levels of salt. So if you remember last semester, there was a chart in your notes on which organisms can survive in the different percentages of salt. So you should already know that when for when you um, take the final exam. So you're already expected to know everything from last semester. So we're just doing a quick review. So Vibrio parahemolyticus does cause diarrhea, although it is less severe than Vibrio cholera, and it occurs 24 to 48 hours after ingestion of contaminated seafood. Vibrio vulnificus, the, the problem with vulnificus is those wound infections in immunocompromised individuals which lead to septicemia. So the Vibrio vulnificus wound infections tend to be more common in, as I said, immunosuppressed individuals, especially individuals that have liver dysfunction. So alcoholics, people with cirrhosis of the liver, and any condition that produces high serum levels of iron. Vibrio alginolyticus is a common inhabitant of marine wa waters and it can be involved in eye, ear, and wound infections associated with contact with contaminated seawater. 
Here's a gram stain of Vibrio, typical gram negative rod, although Vibrio is a curved gram negative rod and can be comma shaped, although it can look somewhat gull wing shaped at times as well. So all these curved organisms, they're not always, not every single organism has a curve and they don't always have the same curvy look to them. They might be slightly different. Okay, remember that the selective media for Vibrio is TCBS or thiosulfate citrate bile salt sucrose agar. It identifies the sucrose fermenters, which Vibrio cholera is a sucrose fermenter and will turn yellow on this media. Most of the Vibrio species will be green due to non-sucrose fermentation. And TCBS is just a good media, uh, media for Vibrio because it's going to inhibit your normal flora, allow most Vibrios to grow perfectly fine. So here is your Vibrio on the TCBS media and you'll see your sucrose fermenting organisms, your Vibrios will be a nice bright yellow. Okay, your Cinea enter enterocolitica. This is a gastrointestinal tract infection, transmission fecal oral route due to ingestion of contaminated food. Many times um, foods that have milk products in them tend to be involved in your Cinea enterocolitica, but many foods are involved in your Cinea enterocolitica infection. So the clinical manifestations are enterocolitis, abdominal pain, and the abdominal pain tends to be very similar to appendicitis. So many people have gone to the emergency room and actually had their appendix removed when in fact they had a Yersinia enterocolitica infection and not anything wrong with their appendix. It has le led to septicemia, but that's very rare. And Here's a gram stain of, a couple of gram stains of Yersinia enterocolitica, typical gram negative rod. So the thing about Yersinia is there is selective media specific for Yersinia, which is CIN agar, Cephalidin ergosin novobiosin agar. But remember that CIN agar also allows Aeromonas species to grow. So just because you have an organism growing on CIN agar doesn't automatically mean that it's Yersinia. It might be Aeromonas. So this is a peptone-based agar that has yeast extract. Mannitol is a carbohydrate source and bile salts. And the indicators in it are neutral red and crystal violet. So here you have your cinea growing on CIN agar, and CIN agar is kind of a pinkish red agar, and your cinea tends to have dark red centers and a lighter pink area on the outside of or the edge of the colony. So your cinea has a very characteristic look to it on this agar. Remember last semester we talked about some of the enrichment broths will, which will allow enhancement of recovery of some of the GI pathogens. The GI pa pathogens tend to be difficult to grow, so you need some sort of enrichment broth to give them time to grow and inhibit some of the normal flora. So enrichment broths are GN broth, selenite F, and campy thioglycolate. You incubate them in ambient air at 37 degrees for 6 to 8 hours. So then once you, you take your specimen, you incubate the enrichment broth. You put the enrichment broth in the incubator for 6 to 8 hours. You then take a couple of drops of that enrichment broth. You mix it up, take a couple of drops, and put it onto your various selective plates. So whatever selective plates your lab uses, you'd put some drops of the enrichment broth on and then 
street them out for isolation. Put those in the ambient air incubator at 35 to 37 degrees overnight and then look at your plates. If it were Campylobacter, you'd put them in your micro aerophilic, your campy pack and in a 42 degree incubator. Okay, the organism that causes pseudomembranous colitis and that's Clostridium difficile. So this Clostridium difficile causes either what's called pseudomembranous colitis or antibiotic associated colitis. So Clostridium difficile tends to follow antimicrobial therapy. So what happens is you get a disturbance of the normal bowel flora. You're taking antibiotics, you're getting rid of all of your lactobacillus and E. coli and enterococcus and all this normal flora in your GI tract. And some people carry Clostridium difficile, but it's kept at low numbers. If your normal flora gets depleted, the Clostridium difficile starts to get higher in number and then what happens is it can generate toxins which then can cause problems. So Clostridium difficile is more common as a nosocomial infection um, even though it's really many times endogenous, it's the person's own flora that is causing the infection. But many times you're in the hospital, you're getting IV antibiotics, and that's when you get the pseudomembranous colitis. So there are two toxins that are formed, toxin A, which is an enterotoxin that causes diarrhea, and toxin B, which is a cytotoxin and damages the GI mucosal epithelial cells. So how do you diagnose pseudomembranous colitis or antibiotic associated colitis? Well, it's based on the clinical criteria as well as some lab tests. So you can do endoscopy on a patient and look for those pseudomembranes or plaque formations or the the typical features of colitis. An appropriate history, someone that's been taking antibiotics and then has the correct symptoms, so it would make sense that they have an antibiotic associated colitis. And there are three different tests that are available. So you can culture for Clostridium difficile, however, there are people that have Clostridium difficile in their intestines normally. So just because it grows up doesn't mean necessarily that it's causing a problem. You really need to find the toxin. So in most labs now, they're doing C. difficile toxin te detection tests. So there are many brand new C. difficile toxin tests available right now, and most labs are using these tests. Previously, it used to be that C. difficile toxin testing was sent out to a reference lab or the health state health department, but now it's done by most labs in-house with some nice... Um, quick and reliable tests, uh, toxin tests are available right now. So how do you know if someone has a GI infection? So of course you want to look at their clinical history. Have they recently traveled? Have they recently traveled to an area that's known to have certain types of um, food Born infections? Have they recently ingested something that's known to be associated with causing a foodborne infection, such as an undercooked chicken or raw oysters or something like that? The physical examination, their clinical presentation, what's wrong with them? Do they have a fever? Do they not have a fever? Do they have diarrhea? Is there blood and mucus in the diarrhea? Is there white blood cells? As well as the laboratory diagnosis. Diagnosis. So for the food vehicles, if it's undercooked chicken, then you'd most likely suspect salmonella or campylobacter. If it's 
eggs, again, possibly salmonella, campylobacter. If it's unpasteurized milk, salmonella, campylobacter, or Yersinia species. If it's water, possibly campylobacter, but again, we always have to think about our parasites, our viruses, our other types of organisms. So there's the parasite Giardia lamblia, there's Norwalk virus, there's the parasite Cyclospora, Cryptosporidium. So, but for this course, we're just focusing on the bacteria. Okay, if it's a rice or maybe a fried rice that hasn't been sufficiently warmed up, it would be food poisoning due to preformed bacillus cereus toxin. If it's fish or shellfish, you would think of a Vibrio species or Norwalk virus. If it's another type of fish like tuna, mackerel, gr grouper, there's a parasite, Anisakis, that is commonly involved in raw fish. If it's beef or gravy, then you'd think Salmonella, Campylobacter, or Clostridium perfringens. So your pathogenic mechanisms your enterotoxin mediated diarrhea so those organisms that produce enterotoxins usually these symptoms are rapid to come on there usually is no fever and no white blood cells would be found in the stool the organisms that form toxins and that's how you get sick is through ingestion of preformed toxin. That's your Staphylococcus aureus, Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium botulinum, and Bacillus cereus should be there. For your colonization and toxin production, you have Clostridium difficile, your Vibrio cholera, your EHEC or E. coli 0157H7, as well as your enterotoxigenic E. coli. Your invasive organisms, these would have a longer incubation period. They need time to get into the intestines, invade into the cells, cause an inflammatory response. So longer incubation period, usually a fever is present, and you would see white blood cells in the stool. So organisms that cause systemic, can cause a systemic infection, get outside of the GI tract and into the bloodstream, that would be Salmonella typhi and Aeromonas. And those that cause localized invasion, so they stay in, in the intestinal tract, that would be non-typhoidal Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter jejuni, Vibrio parahemolyticus, Yersinia enterocolitica, and enter So of course for lab diagnosis, you need to culture the appropriate body fluid. So in many inst instances for GI infection, it's going to be a stool specimen. However, if it's an, uh, a septicemia that is followed by a GI tract, it could be a blood specimen. Your routine culture media usually is going to be blood agar McConkie agar, and possibly one other more selective ent um, enteric media, such as hectoenteric agar, or HE, or xyloslicine deoxycholate, or XLD. So many labs will plate, some will just plate blood McConkie, some will plate blood McConkie XLD, or blood McConkie HE, some will automatically add a campy, agar to any stool specimen doing a stool pathogen workup. Usually you would have to suspect a Vibrio in order to add a TCBS agar, suspect EHEC to order a sorbitol McConkie plate. So it depends on what's 
what's ordered that you might add other things to your blood macaque and your one other selective media and possibly your campy. So some labs for stools are only going to plate three plates, some are going to plate five, some might plate six. It varies from lab to lab. Okay, here is a direct fecal smear gram stain, and you could see tons and tons of white blood cells. So this would be more indicative of an invasive process, one of your invading foodborne infections as opposed to a food poisoning. So you will talk about... Um, parasites at the end of the summer so many of our parasites cause diarrhea so just because someone has diarrhea it doesn't automatically mean they have salmonella or shigella or campylobacter many times they do but not always there could be a parasitic infection in this slide you could see cryptosporidium parvum and cyclospora species and it could also be a virus there's many enteroviruses that cause diarrhea Okay, here is a special stain looking at another parasitic agent. More parasites, entamoeba and giardia. So points to remember, you have to always think of the clinical findings, the history of the patient, have they recently traveled? What have they eaten? And it's not always what did they eat an hour ago or even this morning. What did they eat yesterday? What did they eat for the past week? Because there are certain organisms that have very long incubation periods. Campylobacter has between 3 and 10 days. So it might be what you ate 7 days ago. So that incubation period, you always have to think in mind, the laboratory findings, the methods that you need to recover. Do you need an enrichment broth? Do you need special media? Do you need special environmental conditions like for Campylobacter? You always want to think of the characteristics of the pathogens. What will they look like? What will salm Salmonella look like on XLD? What will Shigella look like on HE and all those key identification features, your flow charts, what do they look like on triple sugar iron agar, which, which sugars will they ferment, do they produce gas, are they H2S producers. So you, those are, you, you should already know all of those key diagnostic tests for these pathogens. So remember if you have any questions just send me an email.